each specific method, if at all. Okay. So, <clears throat> the first method that we went through is just simple factoring. Sorry. The first method that we went through was just simple factoring. And we use this method when the leading coefficient is equal to 1. The second we met method we went through was factoring by grouping. And we use this method when the leading coefficient was not equal to 1. So an example of this one would be x squared plus 4x plus 3 equals 0. An example of this would be like 2x squared plus 8x minus 5 equals 0. And I don't know that that potentially has a solution, but the point is the leading coefficient is not 1, right? Um, the third method was difference of squares. And we did that when we had two perfect squares. For instance, 4x squared minus 9 equals 0. And remember, I'd find a was 2x and b was 3, and it would be 2x plus 3 times 2x minus 3 equals 0. And I'd set those both equal to 0. You guys remember this? Okay. And remember, if factoring by the simple way, it's just find the factors of this number. Factoring by grouping, I multiply them. I get 10. I factor that number and then split the middle term. You guys remember that? Remember that? Okay, so that was factoring by grouping. Then we learned how to solve by taking the square root. And what would this be? Well, it could be something similar, for instance, like if I had x squared minus uh, 16 equals 0, right? I could just add 16 to both sides. I get x squared equals 16, then take the square root, plus or minus, x would equal plus or minus 4, or x equals 4, negative 4, and x equals positive 4. That's the square root method. I'm not factoring in that case, I'm just taking the square root. Computer's away, everyone. Um, so that's the square root method. And then the fifth and final method we used was quadratic formula. And that's when I have ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. And my quadratic formula was x equals negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Cool, right? All right, so those are our five methods. Then the question is, when do we use these methods, if at all? Now, if I tell you specifically to factor, then these last two methods don't come into account. It's only the first three. If I'm telling you just to factor, well, if the leading coefficient is one, you just do simple factoring. If the leading coefficient is not one, you do factoring by grouping. And if you specifically have the difference of two perfect squares, then you do the difference of squares factoring. Does that make sense? But if I'm asking you just to solve for x, well then in that case, I'm, I'm going to have to choose which one is the easiest and most efficient way. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. So if I'm asking you to solve for x, Well, there are some specific situations. If the leading coefficient is equal to 1, 
the first thing I try to do is factoring. If the leading coefficient is 1, I'm going to check to see if I can factor it. If I have x squared plus 4x plus 3, I check if I can factor it. If I can, good, I factor it. I get x plus 3 times x plus 1, I set them both equal to 0. x equals negative 3, x equals negative 1, I'm done. Right? The simplest way. If the leading coefficient is 1, I do just simple factoring because it's the easiest and it's the fastest. But with that being said, every time the leading coefficient is 1, it's not necessarily true that every time the leading coefficient is 1, you can factor. Sometimes you can't factor. And so you might check simple factoring, and you might find that it doesn't work. And in that case, you go to the quadratic formula. If you try to simple factor, and that doesn't work, you go to the quadratic formula and you solve it that way. Okay, does that make sense? So if the leading coefficient is 1, you try simple factoring. If that doesn't work, you go to the quadratic formula. If the leading coefficient does not equal 1, you could do factoring by grouping. But here's what I will say. You guys remember that process of factoring by grouping? Multiply the first and the last number, right? Or first pull out any common factors, multiply the first and the last number, factor that, then use that to split the middle, We'll kind of find the common factors, the first two, pull it out, group it, all that. You guys remember generally factoring by grouping? It's quite the process, though. If I have to factor, guys, if I have to factor an expression with a leading coefficient that's not 1, then I've really got no choice. I have to use factoring by grouping. But if they're asking me to solve for x, well, that's a different case. I don't have to use factoring by grouping. Because it's such a long process that I might as well do the other thing that's quite a long process, but in a lot of sense is simple, more simple. I go immediately to the quadratic formula. Does that make sense? If my leading coefficient is not 1, like it's 2 or 3 or negative 7 or whatever it may be, I immediately go to the quadratic formula. Why? Well, 1, if I do factoring by grouping, that's just a long process anyway. And 2... I might try to do factoring by grouping and then realize that my equation is not factorable, that the expression is not factorable, and then I'd have to use the quadratic formula anyway. Does that make sense? So rather than wasting the time of going through factoring by grouping and maybe not even having assurance, you know, not even having assurance that it's going to work, just go straight to the quadratic formula. Does that make sense, guys? Is that pretty clear? Okay, so the leading coefficient is not one, go to the quadratic formula. Okay. If I have, now mind you, remember this is all for ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. If I have the b term equals zero, so that means there's no x. So what would that look like? It would look like 3x squared minus 12 equals zero. Right? This is just an example. Notice there's no x term. There's an x squared term and there's a constant term. Right? There's no x term. In that case, if I have the b term equal to 0, that means there's no x, then I immediately do the square root. If I notice that the two ones are perfect squares, for instance, like 4x squared minus 9, I could do difference of squares. And so if you want to do difference of squares, you can do difference of squares um, if they're perfect squares. But what I would suggest to you is that you just do the square root because effectively it ends up being kind of more simple anyway and more intuitive. Okay, But if you feel really comfortable doing difference of squares, you can do difference of squares. Any questions? Okay, so what did I just show you? Well, I showed you every possible example, okay? Now, the only other one is if c is equal to 0, and what would this be? Like 4x squared plus 3x equals 0. So there is no c term, then I pull out the x. 
And what does this look like? Well, this would look like x times 4x minus 3 equals 0, you see? And then I would set them both equal to 0, x equals 0, and 4x minus 3 equals 0. Does that make sense to you guys? If I don't have a c term, then I just pull out the x. I factor out the x. And then I can immediately set them both equal to 0. Does that make sense to you? Okay. So these are basically the only four possibilities that we have. All right, notice that I can't not have an a term. If I don't have an x squared term, I don't have a quadratic equation. I've just got a linear equation, right? If there's no x squared, if it's just x and the number, then it's a linear equation, and it becomes simple. So I've definitely got an a term. I could maybe, but out of my a terms, they're either one or not one. So that covers everything for A, right? Either the one or not one. And then I have an option. I might not have a B term. Well, if I don't have a B term, I go to the square root. You see? And if I don't have a C term, then I pull out an X. So that covers everything. So now no matter what kind of quadratic equation you have, you have the skills to be able to solve. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. So with that... Um, we're going to go into some practice, okay? I'm going to do, um, I'm going to do like one or two, and then I'm going to give you guys the rest of the hour just to start your homework, okay? Does that make sense? So you should be able to finish it. All right, so let's go right into it. All right, so we start with number two. Sorry. Um, 404, yep. So we start with page 404. And we go into it. We crack at it, all right? Part of being a mathematician, which you all are, is you start receiving the pure and simple joy of cracking at a math problem. It's like, oh. You look at it, and it looks like a solid fortress, and you come in like, like a wrecking ball. You just like, smash math problem, smash. And you just like, just crack it, and smash it, and you just like, yes. And then you, then you throw stuff. I don't know. Anyhow, leading coefficient. What's the leading coefficient? One. So what should I check first? I should try to factor it first. One and 12, two and six, three and four. Does any of these combine to make negative seven? Three and four. I get x minus three times x minus four equals zero. That's why it's worth it to check factoring rather than just going immediately to quadratic formula. For the record, you could always just go to quadratic formula. Why don't you just immediately go to quadratic formula for everything? Because it takes a while, right? It's faster to do it this way. Do you understand what I'm saying? You could always solve every quadratic equation with quadratic formula, okay? But obviously it's not always the best. You set this equal to zero, x minus three equals zero, x minus 4 equals 0. You add 3 to both sides. Add 4 to both sides. Get x equals 3. And x equals 4. Okay, so that's just a simple example. Okay. Any questions on that? And this homework, this homework assignment is a lot like what your quiz is going to be like. You understand? Yes, sir. Are you going to grade us based off of which method you choose to do? No way. I will tell you, though, that, like, for, for instance, if you choose, like, factoring and you don't show me a lot of work and you're just like, oh, three and four, and then you end up with the wrong answer. I will be much more harsh than if you like, like chose 
quadratic formula, which is the more challenging method, but also like more precise. You understand what I'm saying? And you showed me all your work, you see? Really what it comes down to is showing the work. If you, no matter what method you choose, if you don't show a lot of work, I will be way more harsh with like partial credit. Does that make sense? Whereas if you show all your work and I see, oh, you, you flip the sign here and that's what messed you up, then potentially I'll take off one point versus two or three. Okay. All right. Good question. But you can choose whichever method you want. And the whole idea is to choose whichever one you think is the easiest. Okay. All right. 3x squared minus 64. What am I missing here? What term? The B term. So what do I default to? Square root. But before I do the square root, I should check if there's a common factor that I can pull out. For the record, I always check if there's a common factor to pull out. Is there here? Yeah. Not 6. Not 2. 2 is... No. I, no. 4. 9x squared minus 16 equals 0. I divide both sides by 4. I get 9x squared minus 16 equals 0. Now, you could look at this and notice that these are two perfect squares, right? If they're two perfect squares, you might as well do um, difference of squares. So this would be 3x, this would be 4. So this would be 3x plus 4 times 3x minus 4 equals 0. You set them both equal to 0. 3x plus 4 equals 0. 3x minus 4 equals 0. What? Here? That's a B. It should be, but it should be, but remember with it's that's why it's confusing. Because A and B, remember it's A squared minus B squared. They use A and B for different things than we use it for in the quadratic formula. But you can use look, I'm just gonna go through this quickly because this is not the way that I recommend you do it. I have 4 to both sides, 3x equals 4. Divide both sides by 3. And you'd get x equals negative 4 thirds and x equals positive 4 thirds. Okay? I went through that quickly because it's not the way I recommend you do it. Why? When I told you if b is equal to 0, what did I recommend you do? Square root. And I stand by that. Why? Well, because difference of squares is not necessarily intuitive and you might make a mistake, and you've got to do a whole lot of work because you have to solve two separate equations. But if you just do the square root method, well then you bypass this whole finding a and b, and you just go ahead and solve for x. You add 16 to both sides, you get 9x squared equals 16. I'm just going to cordon this off because this is the other way. Then I divide by 9, I get x squared equals 16 over 9, right? And this all seems fairly intuitive, right? Okay, and then I square root both sides, plus or minus, squared disappears. x equals plus or minus radical 16 over 9. Now, to some of you, this might seem like a barrier. Like, I don't know the square root of 16 over 9, but that's why we remember our quotient property x equals plus or minus the square root of 16 over the square root of 9. I split them up. Does that make sense? Okay. And what does that become? x equals plus or minus the square root of 16 is 4 over the square root of 9 is 3. Or in other words, x equals negative 4 thirds and x equals positive 4 thirds. I don't know about you, but to me that seems easy. It's... It's hard to say it's less work, but it kind of is. I mean, like, what do you do? You divide both sides by 9, you take the square root, and then you simplify the square root. Once you simplify the square root, you're there, right? Whereas this, you have to find A and B, and then do this, and then solve both equations. You understand what I'm saying? So it's kind of less work, depending upon what, how you see it. But the thing that's beneficial about this, to me, that makes it more attractive is that it's, like, intuitive, right? It's like, oh, how do I solve for x? Well, I solve for x directly. I don't have to factor. I just 
get x by itself, square root of both sides, and then simplify the square root. Does that make sense to you guys? Understand? Yes. You can't do it that way. Like take the whole square root of the whole thing. Like the average control. Both sides. Yeah. yeah, you could have done that. You could have done that, and then you would have ended up with um, 6x equals plus or minus 8. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. It depends on, on how you want to do it. Okay, but that's good. All right, any questions on this? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Good. Any questions? So what was the whole thing here? I don't mean to confuse you with this. The whole idea was just to show you that, look, I ended up with the same answers anyway. Might as well use the square root method. It's more intuitive. Any questions on that? No? Okay. Um, I'm going to do one more. And I'll let you go. Um, actually, I'll do two more probably. Number four. Okay. What do I? What's What's challenging about this that makes it me have to do something before I try and solve? Yeah, I got it's not equal to zero. I gotta get it equal to zero, so I subtract two from both sides. I end up with four x squared minus four x minus five equals zero. What is the leading coefficient for do, are there any common factors that I can pull out? No. No. So leading coefficient is not equal to one, so what do I do immediately? Quadratic function. I could do factoring by grouping. If I was asked to factor, I would. But I'm not asked to factor. I'm asked to solve. Okay. So I solve. A equals, using the quadratic formula, x equals negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Okay. All I have to do is determine a, b, and c. a is equal to 4. b is equal to negative 4 c is equal to negative 5. What do I end up with? x equals negative negative 4 plus or minus the square root negative 4 squared minus 4 times 4 times negative 5 all over 2 times 4. Does that make sense? All right, then I go ahead and simplify. X equals negative negative 4 is positive 4, plus or minus the square root of negative 4 squared is 16, minus 4 times 4 is 16, times negative 5 is negative 80, but it's a negative out here, so it becomes positive 80, all over 2 times 4 is 8. Further simplifying that, I get 4 plus or minus square root of 96 over 8. Now, in order to continue, I've got to look at that radical. Is 96 a perfect square? No. So i got to see if I can simplify it. In order to simplify it, I have to see if any of its factors are perfect squares. So I think, okay, 1, yeah, obviously, 4. Four works, but I want to check if there's a bigger one, because if there's a bigger one, I should pull that one out. Um, 9, no. 16, well, let me think. 16 times 6 is 96. Yeah, 16 is a factor. So I go ahead and pull that out. So radical 96 turns into the square root of 16 times 6, okay, which I then split up to square root of 16 times square root of 6, which becomes 4 radical 6. And so there I go. I've got x equals 4 plus or minus, instead of radical 96, 4 radical 6 all over 8. 
that make sense? Now, um, there are a couple ways I could do this. I could divide each one of these by eight and separate it completely, and that's cool, but generally speaking, I wouldn't do that. Um, I would pull out a common factor from the top and do it that way, okay? So you guys, are you comfortable with where I am so far? Any questions on that? I just, yes, sir. Like pulled out a four here. Yeah, or like a two. Yeah, I could have, but the thing is that that's not going to help because now I'm working with two different terms. I should combine them first, always, and then pull out. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, what you're saying technically is accurate, but to explain the answer to it is way more steps than I think what you're wanting. Does that make sense? Here, it's best just combine them and then pull out. Cool. All right, so we're comfortable with I got here, how I got here. Any questions on how I got there? Okay, so I'm here, so now I want to see if there's a common factor. Is there a common factor on my terms on the top? Four, right? So I pull out the four, it becomes four times one plus or minus radical six all over eight, which then becomes... The 4 cancels out. 1 plus or minus radical 6 over what? 2. Right. Because the 4 cancels out. 8 divided by 4 is 2. Right? Can we do anything else to simplify this? Not that I can see. So I just split them up. x equals 1 minus radical 6 over 2. And x equals 1 plus radical 6 over 2. That's my final answer. Michael, why don't you come sit over here? I love you, man. Come sit in the regular place. Thank you. All right. Any questions on that? Quadratic formula, guys, I'm, I don't have to make light of it. Obviously, there's a lot of steps to it. But the thing about quadratic formula is like practice is key here. If you practice enough of these, it becomes almost arbitrarily simple because it's just the same things over and over and over again. All right? And you just have to memorize the formula, and then you're just plugging it in and simplifying. You don't have to remember this big old process. You just have to remember how to simplify. And that's algebra stuff that you've been doing for a while. Any questions? Okay. I'm going to do one more, and then I will let you work on your homework. Thank you, sir. All right. First off, number six, I have 5x squared plus 0x minus 13. Do I care about that 0x? No. So what method should I use if the b term is 0? Square root. I do the square root method. Let's actually take a look at that one. So I'll do two more, just this one and another one. Okay. So this just, I don't care about that 0x term. It's just 5, 5x squared minus 13 equals 0. So since I don't have a b term, I just use the square root method. I add 13 to both sides, I get 5x squared equals 13. I then divide both sides by 5. I end up with x squared equals 13 over 5. Okay. That's how I start. So I just get x by itself, the x squared term by itself, I get x squared equals 13 over 5. Then what do I do next? Square root both sides. You have to remember the plus or minus. That square term cancels out. I end up with x equals plus or minus square root of 13 
over 5. Now, you can leave it like that, and I won't really be mad at you if you end up giving me x equals negative square root of 13 over 5, and x equals positive square root of 13 over 5. It's really not appropriate to do it that way. You usually should do something called rationalizing the denominator, or you can just do the division. 13 divided by 5, 2... I'm sorry, minus 10, 3.0, 30, 5, 2.6. So in other words, x equals negative radical 2.6 or x equals positive radical 2.6. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. Last one I'm going to do for you guys is number eight. Number eight, which term is missing, A, B, or C? C. When the C term is missing, what do we do? Pull out the X. Guys, whenever I start factoring, the first thing I look for is a common factor. So this isn't anything different. I just look for a common factor. What's the common factor here? 3x, right? So I just pull out 3x. This becomes x minus 2 equals 0, and there you go. I can solve for this directly. First, I set 3x equal to 0, and then I set x minus 2 equal to 0. I divide both sides by 3. I get x equals 0, and then I add 2 to both sides. I get x equals 2. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Any questions on that? Okay. What is your homework? Your homework is not from 1. It starts from number 2, and it goes on to number 17. 2 to 17. Page 404. Number 2 to 17. So you got a little bit less than 15 minutes. Page 404, numbers 2 to 17. Yes. Go right ahead, yep. Hold on one second.